courtesies of the House. Thank you very much, Minister. And we're now moving on. As I say, the next item on the order paper is a motion on the introduction of legislation equivalent to Helen's Law. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Please read the motion. That this assembly recognises the ongoing pain and trauma experienced by families in Northern Ireland whose loved ones have been murdered and who continue to have no knowledge of the whereabouts of their remains, welcomes the progression in the UK Houses of Parliament of the Prisoners' Disclosure of Information about Victims' Bill, otherwise known as Helen's Law, placing a statutory obligation on the Parole Board to take into account an offender's non-disclosure of such information when making a decision about their release from prison, notes that these obligations apply to prisoners serving a sentence for murder or manslaughter, or for taking or making an indecent photograph of a child, and calls on the Minister of Justice to introduce urgently equivalent legislation in Northern Ireland to ensure that prisoners convicted of murder and child sex offences are not eligible for release until they disclose the location of their victims' remains or the identity of their victims. Uh, thank you. And I call Alex Eason to move the motion. Moved. Uh, thank you. And the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. Please open the debate on the motion. Mr Speaker, this is a very important motion before this Assembly today. It is both important but vital for families who have had a family member or a loved one murdered but have never had a body returned to the family to have a Christian burial. It is why I state from the start of this debate that this motion was not put down and it is not political in nature. There are no hidden agendas and there must be no politics in this debate because of the families. I ask this Assembly to back this motion wholeheartedly as we seek to support those families and send a message out to those who have killed someone and refused to give up the body. You will stay in jail. What is Helen's law or Charlotte's law? It is killers who have concealed victims' remains, who have never been sentenced, who have been sentenced for the crime of murder and do their time, but then face parole refusal. Murderers who refuse to reveal the location of their victims' bodies could be denied parole under a new law. Helen's Law follows a campaign named after Helen McCourt, who was murdered in 1988. Her killer, Ian Sims, has not revealed the location of her remains. Ms McCourt, aged 22, disappeared in 1988 on her way home from work. Sims was convicted of murder but never revealed the location of her remains, so he can continue to have a hold over the family. He was jailed for life in 1989 and told he would have to serve at least 16 years before he would be considered for parole. Nearly 600,000 people signed a petition launched in 2015 calling for the introduction of Helen's Law to block parole for killers who concealed the whereabouts of their victims' bodies. Mrs McCourt, who is still involved in searches for her daughter, said, It has been a terrible stress on me since I started the petition in 2015. This law will help so many other families. I wrote to him, begging him, please, please, just tell me, and you will not hear from me again. I still hope he will remain in prison until he tells me. I hope one day I will know. Unfortunately, it has come too late for the family, as the process through Westminster for this law has not passed all hurdles, and Sims is now out on licence. Here in Northern Ireland, we have a separate justice system, and much of what we ask for and support today will require our Justice Minister to support and introduce. I hope you will not be found wanting, as my hopes and the hopes of the victims' families rest on your shoulders today. In Northern Ireland, we have our own examples of Helen McCourt. We have the Murray family. Johnny Miller was found guilty of murdering Charlotte Murray, his former fiancé. He must serve a minimum of 16 years of his life sentence. Charlotte's body was never found. Miss Murray's family said Miller had put a cruel suffering upon their family by not revealing where her body is. I have met the Murray family with the First Minister and the family have called on all local politicians to bring in a law to prevent killers who can save their victim's body from receiving parole. And it is currently working its way through Westminster. Charlotte's identical twin sister, Denise, said, John Miller murdered our sister and he knows what he has done. We ask of him to tell us where Charlotte's body is and let us bring Charlotte home. We want to say our goodbyes in peace. Another family in Northern Ireland is Lisa Dorian's family. 
Lisa Dorian, a 25-year-old shop assistant from Bangor, went missing in 2005 in my own constituency. Murdered and secretly buried, her remains have never been recovered. The 25-year-old was at a party in Ballyhalbert Caravan Park, which was deserted because it was off-season. Mark Levette, the last man to see her alive, was also there drinking and taking drugs. Detectives believe that Lisa was strangled in the Ballyhalbert Caravan and her body was secretly buried. The family of missing murder victim Lisa has come out to support of a proposed law that would keep convicted killers behind bars until they reveal the location of the victim's body. We are sending a direct message, they say, to the man who hid Lisa's body. We just want to find her. We have asked you, begged you through the media for 15 years to tell us where you have hidden her body. When we get a guilty verdict from the jury, we'll make sure this law is in place that you are never released from prison until you tell us where Lisa is. The determination and dignity of local families of those who have been murdered and whose remains are unknown is what is driving this debate. And we in this chamber must give them real hope that their genuine concerns will be met, not just through our words, but through actions in this assembly. This debate is ultimately about how we support the victims of serious crime and value their grief and trauma. The Minister should not lose sight of what is at stake here. This isn't a time for deflection or sidestepping. Non-disclosure of victims' information should always be taken into consideration. It is vital that any decision to release a prisoner serving time for these serious offences takes statutory consideration of a failure to disclose their victims' whereabouts or identity. The Minister is correct that these matters are routinely considered, but if that is the case, why should we hesitate to put this into law? A routine statutory consideration alone cannot change our outcomes and decisions. There also needs to be binding obligations on parole commissioners to give non-disclosure and the added trauma to victims' families greater weighting when assessing risk to the public. Someone who fails to disclose this information is at a greater risk to the public than somebody who has done so. But this, yes, go ahead. For giving way, would the member agree with me that not only is it a hideous crime to prevent the families to lay to rest their loved one, but the fact that they're denied the knowledge of the final hours of the life of their loved one, and that in itself uh, should be disclosure enough to, to put at least at rest uh, that aspect of this, the heinous crime of murder? I um, thank the member for his intervention and um, those who are involved in murder and can't give up the body after being sentenced shows to me that they are not genuinely sorry for their actions and it's important that these disclosures do take place. It seems victims' health and well-being are not prioritised compared to the risk to the wider community. That is wrong. Helen's Law may act as a driver for offenders to cooperate and disclose information early. We believe that it's an opportunity for offenders to provide accurate information on the location of their victims' remains or the identity of their child victims earlier, if decisions on parole are seen to differ based on disclosure versus non-disclosure. The problem we have is that such a distinction is not readily made in current decisions. It's vital that offenders have an understanding that non-disclosure at each stage of the criminal justice procedure will lead to stricter penalties than if they did. There needs to be an overhaul of the current process in place to ensure a victim-centred approach at every stage. However, the delay in processing the sentencing review continues to be of deep concern to victims and indeed many working, workings in our courts. We can't kick the can down the road any longer. Parole decisions are more sensitive than sentencing because if officials get it wrong, the release of the uncooperative perpetrator can cause new and ongoing trauma to a victim's family. We welcome the focus of Helen's Law on serious sexual offences where the victim is not identified. The number of record sexual offences against children in Northern Ireland have reached an all-time high according to statistics procured in 2019. 2,036 sexual offences against children were recorded in that 12-month period, a significant rise of 34%. That's just unacceptable. Finally, in regards to the Alliance Party Amendment, I have to say, I am frustrated and disappointed by this amendment. And it is clear that the victims of the families were not listened to. And I would appeal for the Alliance Party to withdraw that amendment. The Alliance Amendment 
to the motion to state that this issue is already routinely considered by the parole commissioner for Northern Ireland when assessing prisoners' suitability for release and licence. But if that is the case, why should we hesitate to put this into law? But this is not in every case, so why has SIMS been allowed out on licence? The amendment deflects focus on the current limited Department of Justice consultation with stakeholders and sentencing review and are less committed to bringing forward dedicated legislation. The Minister of Justice has already commissioned a focus consultation with key stakeholders on Helen's Law. A consultation makes no guarantees or commits the Minister to bring this into law. The amendment uses words such as including legislation where appropriate. Where appropriate, what type of language is that to be used in the case of murder? and loved ones having no body returned to them. There's nothing more appropriate than this assembly listening to the victim's family and making this law. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I urge this assembly to reject the amendment, and I urge this assembly to support the motion today, and also urge this assembly to show that this assembly is serious about being tough on crime. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Kelly Armstrong to move the amendment. So moved. Thank you. And uh, you will have 10 minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I speak on the amendment today, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the pain and trauma felt by the families of Charlotte Murray and Lisa Dorian and all families who are still waiting for their loved one to be returned to them. To deny a family the opportunity to say goodbye is cruel. I say directly to all those families, I will not pretend to understand your ongoing pain. All I can say is, I'm sorry. I wish to thank both Mr Easton and Mr Given for bringing forward the motion before us today. There is much I can agree with in the original motion. I welcome and the Alliance Party welcomes the progress of the prisoner's disclosure of information about victims' bill in the UK Houses of Parliament. That law, known as Helen, Helen's Law, is vitally important. However, the amendment here, or sorry, the motion today put forward in front of us goes far beyond what the bill in Westminster actually includes. By preventing a prisoner from being eligible for release because they have not disclosed the location of their victim's remains, that could mean that there are those who are genuinely innocent who will be, in effect, imprisoned in perpetuity. It also doesn't allow for those prisoners who may genuinely cooperate, but who are unable to locate the remains because of due to the passage of time, loss of memory, or difficulties finding distinguishing features and landmarks in the area. You would also potentially find those people trapped in prison forever, and whilst we may believe a long prison sentence is commensurate with their brutal and cruel crimes, this wouldn't reflect their sentence as handed down by the judge and would almost certainly be open to challenge on human rights grounds. I believe we can improve on the content and intent of Helen's Law. I know the Minister for Justice is already committed not to equivalent legislation for Northern Ireland, but more than that. My amendment confirms that there is a consultation underway. There is a sentencing review. The legislation will be brought forward where appropriate. The amendment I put forward today acknowledges the Parole Commission already takes matters into consideration when considering release. However, I don't think anyone in this House wants the Parole Commissioner to just take into account or consider an offender's non-disclosure of remains or identification of a victim from illegal images. Surely we should be seeking to have a weighting added to that consideration. Would it not be better to take into account when a prisoner has made no attempt and given no explanation for that lack of cooperation when weighing up the risk they pose to the public on release? While some in Westminster certainly did call for no disclosure means no release, this has not been included in Helen's Law. If we bring Helen's Law into Northern Ireland, it will not include that clause. It only states the parole board take into account non-disclosure. The resistance for doing so was to allow the parole board there to continue to be able to take its own decisions. 
To deny parole, even on those grounds, would mean a fundamental change to the basis on which the Parole Commission make release decisions and indeed would potentially impact on the framework for public protection sentences. I think we all agree the Parole Commission should be able to take and make decisions based on its independent consideration. Politicians should not be able to interfere in sentencing. As outlined in my amendment, the Minister and the Department of Justice has already commissioned a focused consultation with key stakeholders on Helen's Law to run in parallel with finalising the outcome and the next steps flowing from the sentencing review, including leg legislation where appropriate. Indeed, I will ask the Minister today, in her response later, to confirm if there is an opportunity to enable the Parole Commission to do more than it does today, which is to consider an offender's non-disclosure when making their decision about release. And can she confirm if we can add a waiting to their decision? No one in this room wants families to wait any longer for their loved ones to be returned to them. I don't believe any of us in this chamber want non-disclosure to simply be taken into account. This is why the amendment goes further than the original motion and asks the Minister to take forward her consultation, her sentencing review and legislation, not just to replicate Helen's law. As I said earlier, I do thank the members of the DUP for bringing forward this motion. It is a private member's motion. And this discussion today, no matter what happens, will not bind the Minister for Justice or indeed any minister to have to take action. I would suggest that if we are going to take this forward, that we need to have meetings with the Minister and perhaps the Justice Committee could take it under their remit as part of their work. Perhaps then, by working together, we can have an outcome that enables the Parole Commission to continue to do its work and families to contribute to the outcome. I have proposed an amendment that reflects the ongoing work of the Department of Justice. I'll say again, they have a consultation, there is a sentencing review, and it seeks for legislation to be taken forward where appropriate, because I believe Helen's Law will not deliver what families want. Families do not need any further pain or distress. Helen's Law will not keep offenders in prison for non-disclosure. I ask all if you would consider voting for this amendment. And I call Linda Dillon. Good, Ken Corlea. And I just want to begin by saying I don't think there will be very much between what any of us say in this chamber here today, regardless of whether we're supporting the amendment or not, because we all support the spirit of the motion, and I think that's fair to say. And there's probably very little in the motion that we couldn't support, but there is a little bit that we couldn't support, and we will be supporting the amendment. However, we won't be pushing this to a vote. So just to make members aware, that is our position. I want to begin my contribution today, obviously, by thanking the families of both Charlotte Murray and Lisa Dorian for coming up and meeting with ourselves, or myself and our, my party colleagues, and I'm sure met with many other parties as well here in this chamber. And our deepest thoughts and sympathies are with those families and the many others like them who don't know the whereabouts of their loved ones' remains. We can't even begin to imagine the compounded pain of not having the remains to lay at a place to rest and to have somewhere to go and visit them. And everyone should have that right. And I would call on anyone with any information that can give any family any peace of mind to please bring forward that information in terms of allowing them to establish the whereabouts of the remains of their loved ones. The motion that's before us today, whilst it's asking for the equivalent legislation to Helen's Law, appears to go further than Helen's Law and in doing so potentially strain into the realms of indeterminate sentences, which contravenes human rights laws. And Kelly Armstrong has already outlined the, the issues around that, so I don't intend to, to repeat it. I fully support the spirit of the motion, and as I've already said, there are only a few words within the motion that, that we can't support. I've spoken at length with the families over the weekend, as I also accept that the amendment does not go far enough and gives no firm commitment on next steps that will address the issue and meet the needs of the families. I believe that the amendment may allow the Department to put this on the long finger, when what we actually need is the beginning of a process to produce effective and robust legislation that will deliver for the victims of these crimes and their loved ones. The debate in this chamber today is only the beginning of the process, regardless of what the outcome is. 
The motion is non-binding, as has already been alluded to. And if we as members in this House don't pursue the Minister and the Department to deliver on this issue and insist that she begin to scope out what legislation would look like, then all we're doing is making politics and raising the expectation of families that are campaigning and who are the voices of their loved ones. And that's just not acceptable for any of us. As I've said, I've met with the families and spoken to them at great length over the weekend. And they are determined, articulate and intelligent people who are fighting a very dignified campaign. And they will not have the wool pulled over their eyes, either by members or by the minister. So we owe it to them to work together to deliver legislation to deal with this. This issue cannot simply be lumped in with the sentencing review, as there are elements to this that are not addressed by the sentencing review, particularly around the continued offending in relation to child sex offences. I would call on the Minister to commit to carrying out a bespoke piece of work outside of the sentencing review as a matter of urgency. I am aware that it is the intention of the Minister to meet with the families, and I believe that it would be imperative that the Minister progress this in a positive and proactive manner. Charlotte Murray's killer was sentenced to a minimum of 16 years, and if the Minister and the Justice Department do not bring forward legislation to address this, what is outlined in this motion, the reality is that although the Parole Board will consider the non-disclosure of her remains, there is nothing in statute to send a signal both to the perpetrator of this horrific killing and to the Parole Board to give it significant weight. We will be supporting the amendment and we will not be opposing the motion. Thank you. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the SDLP spokesperson, spokesperson on justice, I rise in support of this motion. The motion very appropriately opens with reference to the trauma experienced by families and loved ones who have been murdered and no knowledge of the whereabouts of their remains. At this point, I want to acknowledge the ongoing pain being experienced by the families of Lisa Dorian and Charlotte Murray, alongside the families of the disappeared, but in particular all those families who continue to live with the unimaginable pain of not being able to lay the remains of their loved one to rest. Non-disclosure of the identity of children who have been used to take or make indecent images also provides an insight to the level of remorse a prisoner feels when they make no effort to help those who simply want to safeguard that child. Our legal system requires a method of marking out those prisoners who choose to continue with the dehumanisation of their victim and who choose to inflict pain on loved ones by not disclosing critical information about the victims. Helen's Law does just that. It is a carefully crafted piece of legislation that includes a level of subjectivity, allowing the Parole Board to make a determination on when a prisoner is making a deliberate decision not to disclose information. The explanatory notice provided ahead of the legislative change to law acknowledged that it was the Parole Board practice to consider non-disclosure or relevant information on living victims. The Prisoner's Disclosure of Information about Victims Bill established that practice into statute. Prisoners in England and Wales are now clearly aware that continued non-disclosure must, by statute, be considered during any, uh, any deliberations for parole. Prisoners who may never act out of anything other than self-interest will be forced to contemplate the consequences of continuing with their decision to withhold information. The SDLP has no hesitation in supporting this motion, even if it does suggest contemplating the legislative process to go further than Helen's Law. And I would even add to that, we could consider the possibility of reflecting any delay in the prisoner's chosen, ta chosen time of disclosure to be reflected in the timing of their parole. The right thing to do here is to push ahead and legislate with these deliberations. To those who have expressed a concern that the removal of eligibility for people may not be human rights compliant, I remind them of two points. Firstly, 
the parole board would be charged with making the determination as to whether this is a deliberate decision not to disclose. The subjectivity rests firmly with them. Secondly, those murderers are paedophiles who deliberately choose to continue to perpetrate the crime through non-disclosure at all times. It is them, nobody else, who holds the power to make themselves eligible for parole. Helen's law, or Charlotte's law, as it is lobbied here in Northern Ireland, is the tool that forces the hands of those into doing the right thing. Victims and their loved ones depend on our support to make this happen. The SDLP welcomes the fact that the Minister has already commissioned a focused consultation with key stakeholders on Helen's Law. The level of deliberations and considerations that formed the legislation in Westminster will inevitably assist in injecting speed into any Northern Ireland deliberations. For this reason, the SDLP, SDLP believe it would be wrong to subject this mature legislative piece to sit alongside the timeline of a much wider sentencing review. The urgent need to deliver on this legislation cannot be emphasised enough. It is a relatively short, piece of, short bill with a huge impact. For this reason, we cannot support the amendment. In supporting the motion, we send a clear message to all those commissioned to sit on a parole board that the direction of this House is to legislate on this matter and the weight of non-disclosure during their deliberation should be used with absolute confidence. The SDLP today will support victims via this motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I call Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And, and first of all, can I uh, thank Mr Easton for, for bringing this uh, before uh, the Assembly. I know you have put a lot of time into this and into supporting uh, the family. Uh, I met with the family of Charlotte Murray uh, and Lisa Dorian for the first time uh, last week. Uh, I sat in front of the twin sister uh, of Charlotte Murray uh, and I saw in their faces the absolute devastation uh, that they are going through day after day, not knowing uh, where their sister is. Mr Dorian, uh, the father of Lisa, uh, sat with the family in support, knowing he hasn't even reached the first step to getting any form of closure or justice. But he sat there and he gave support all out of hope. And hope is a word that I'm going to use a lot. Because they sat with hope that we as an assembly, as legislators, could do something to address this great injustice. Hope. They gripped on to hope that we would do something. Their concern is that any murderer who refuses to divulge the whereabouts of the victim can receive parole and be walking our streets still knowing where that victim's body is and not being held to account. Of course, the Parole Board and the Parole Commission for Northern Ireland can, when the parole comes before them, say that not divulging the whereabouts of the victim uh, is a reason uh, for, for, for parole to be denied an aggravating factor. Of course they can. Of course they can. But there's no guarantee. Because that was not the guarantee for Helen McCourt. Because after delay, after delay, after delay, the murder uh, of her was allowed out and is walking the streets now. Not only that, but the mother of Helen had to pay him £40,000 because she took a legal case to try and keep him in prison. I think it is absolutely disgraceful. It is shocking. We do not want to be down that road. And it didn't work for Vanessa George, released after 10 years, having abused children and took pictures, and then refused to divulge who the children were that she abused, who in later life may well recall what went on. But she's out walking the streets, knowing who those children are. The purpose of sending sin is punishment protection of the public, deterrence, rehabilitation and reparations. Sometimes we forget about deterrence. And I've said it time and time again. What is wrong with an all-life sentence? 
It's in the sentencing review. It can be considered. We can do it. And this is one of those reasons where I think we should. Because here is the reality for the family of Charlotte Murray. They will suffer a living death every single day now for the next 16 years. And they will not know until the murderer of Charlotte goes before the parole board whether or not he will get parole. They won't know. So they have to suffer that for 16 years. And if he's denied parole, then they have to wait for another two years suffering before he's up again to see if he gets parole. It's inhumane. Absolutely inhumane. We well, should be absolutely clear and telling him if you do not divulge where the body of your victim is, you will not be getting parole. I said this before, that the family live in hope. And we all know the limitations of any legislation. Of course we do. But let's not snuff out the hope that the family have. Because it's all they have and other people have. Of course, I will be supporting this motion. I cannot support the amendment because the amendment snuffs out hope and there's no requirement for it. A previous Justice Minister only this morning, Claire Sugden said, asked a simple question this morning, why can we not approve uh, a legislative consent motion to adopt the legislation that is bound for England and Wales? Why not? Why not show purpose? Why not show strong justice? Why not put something in place? And if it means a whole life sentence, then do you know what? It has to be a whole life sentence. It's not happened very often, but it can happen. And I believe everybody in this assembly, when they think about it, think it's right that if you kill somebody and bury their body and do not divulge it, you should not be allowed out of prison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Paul Frew. Speaker, and can I first of all commend my colleague Alex Easton for his opening remarks and also the spirit of which this debate has uh, continued uh, with some very, very powerful speakers uh, coming forward to voice their opinion. And I value that. I really do value the, the parliamentary spirit of which this debate is taking place. And it, it, it's at times like this where you feel proud to be an MLA because I believe that most of us, if not all of us, are wanting exactly the same thing. We may well have a different route of travel, but we all want exactly, exactly the same thing. Having said that, I think it was Lord Castlereagh who made the uh, saying that he despised the, the, the period of parliamentary spirit which leads to nothing. So it is on all of us to make sure that something happens here after this debate. So we can all argue and debate around the motion or the amendment, uh, but I think we need to make sure that we come together and send a message out there to those victims and loved ones that we're with you, we hear you, and we want to try and make a difference to your life, because that would be a very powerful message to send to those loved ones. But when someone commits the heinous crime of murder, or unlawful killing, or is involved in sexual uh, violence and abuse towards young people. It is a heinous crime and in the, the act of murder it may well be just a one-off action that commits murder that brings misery onto loved ones for, forever, forever in a day of their life. But there is a certain power with a perpetrator who commits murder. It's a power that they may well have inside them that they may, may well, in some hideous way, enjoy. And if they do, the actual power over information becomes much more sinister and much more powerful. And I think it was Sinead Bradley who said earlier on that is a, pris a prisoner's non-disclosure is a deliberate decision. It is a deliberate act. And that act heaps more power onto the perpetrator. But not only that, it impacts on the family every second, every second of their lives. It rocks them to their core for every second 
of their lives. And some of these people are elderly, and they have to live with this and face this every waking second of their lives. How could any of us ever manage to even fathom what that means for loved ones facing this cruelty? For these loved ones, it is a sentence that they will never, ever overcome. They will never, ever get over. Yet the perpetrator will sit in there and decide a deliberate action not to disclose. And what would that disclosure bring? It won't bring their loved ones back. Absolutely not. But it will, it will allow the family to lay to rest the remains of their loved ones. But not only that, as I've already alluded to earlier, it may well help to piece together the final hours and minutes of their loved ones. Horrendous as that may seem, they will be able to piece together that story and maybe even some of the experiences of their loved one as they went through their final hours. Now, that's a horrendous thought and story, but that would bring so much closure to the loved ones of the murdered. And I can't for the life of me understand why, why it isn't a natural place to place on a, a duty onto the parole bo board to take this into statute, to take this into place. It isn't good enough to place this in a sentencing review. It's much more than that. It has to be much more than that. It is the essence of power that a perpetrator wields on a family, not just their murdered victim, but their murdered victim's family. We cannot abide by that. This house should not abide by that. This house can do something about it. This Minister of Justice can do something about it. And I, beg, time's up. and I plead that that would be the case. Members, time's up. And that we would move on and produce something here for the loved ones here today. Thank you. And I call Gemma Dolan. Firstly, I want to send my condolences to the families of Charlotte Murray and Lisa Dorian, whose courage and persistence has seen this issue being brought here today. I am totally sympathetic to the need for additional protections to safeguard the rights of victims and their families, and I fully support the families in their search for truth and justice. Whilst taking another person's life is one of the most serious and horrific crimes, I consider one willfully holding back information regarding the whereabouts of their victims' remains as another offence and a continued offence, and therefore there is a serious need for additional protections to prevent such an offence continuing. When we're dealing with the issue of child sex offences, there are a number of additional concerns which warrant immediate attention. In relation to indecent photographs of children, unless the identity of that child or children is known to the authorities, then there is a real risk that this child may still be suffering abuse at the hands of child sex offenders, and everything in our power must be done to avoid this abuse happening. Further still, for as long as the photograph is in existence, and the identity of the child is unknown, then this is continued abuse, which may continue to have a serious and long-lasting impact on the child, including further in their later life. All must be done to track down the victims of these crimes, to ensure that appropriate support can be provided to them, but also to ensure that this abuse is not continuing. Innocent families who are suffering immensely already should not have their grief compounded as a result of offenders continuing to torture them by not disclosing information on their victims. We need to find a legislation which has the result of both compelling offenders to disclose information about their victims, but one which also has a dual functionality of being a proper, effective deterrent to prevent offences like this being carried out in the future. All victims are entitled to truth and closure. We are determined to find legislation what makes it much harder for offenders to be released if they have not disclosed information about their victims and we are determined to find legislation which is effective and robust. Our test in setting out what would be an acceptable piece of legislation will be threefold. That it effectively compels offenders to disclose information around the whereabouts and identities of their victims. That it acts as an effective deterrent to any future offenders carrying out such heinous and horrific crimes. That it is robust, human rights compliant legislation 
which will not be open to legal challenge in the future. Legislation which effectively considers and mitigates against any potential unintended consequences. I don't believe that the original motion does this. However, I do commit to working with the Justice Minister to move this work forward urgently. I would like to see the consultation committed to in the amendment carried out urgently and we would like to see the outcome of this consultation before committing to a way forward. Any legislation must satisfy the key test that I have just outlined if it is to be effective and suitable. Thank you. Okay, members, before I bring uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, as the business on the order paper is not expected to be disposed of by 6 p.m., in accordance with standing order 10.3, I will allow business to continue until 7 p.m. or until the business is completed. And I call Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And was grateful uh, to the, uh, the family of Charlotte Murray and Elisa Dorian uh, taking time to uh, speak uh, with myself and my party colleagues. Uh, I think their physical um, pain is clearly seen. I can't even begin to imagine the emotional and psychological uh, torment that they're experiencing. And I also think this evening of the family of Arlene Arkinson, who, who also signed, I understand, the petition and supports uh, this bill. Um, her killer uh, went to his grave, keeping that secret. And, you know, the, the act of disappearing a victim's remains is such a heinous crime. I think that it's still deemed to be a war crime under the Geneva Convention. And the, some speakers, Mr. Speaker, have already alluded to the coercive control nature, particularly in relation to the murder of Charlotte Murray. And this is a, a, a continuation of that coercive control and power. And we're all being better educated, I think, thanks to the, the, the work around domestic abuse and violence, of getting a better understanding of the other forms other than physical assault that many victims of domestic uh, abuse have to suffer. Uh, we're pleased to be able to support the motion. I believe it is the right thing to do. I think it gives the right message, uh, particularly to those who have been convicted. But in speaking to the two families, it was very clear, uh, particularly from Mr Dorian, if he had to, uh, and, and, and this is a common uh, that I find in many uh, interactions I've had with many victims' families, if they had to choose between truth and justice, they, they want to go for the truth in terms of getting the victim's remains uh, returned, and that says a lot. So wh whilst uh, the family of Charlotte Murray has got uh, some level of justice, they still have not, very clearly not, uh, got closure. And in her contribution in relation to the amendment, Kelly Armstrong said about how landscape changes and how difficult it would be and about the indeterminate nature, others have said about not being human rights compliant in relation to any sentence if that were to be a condition of parole. So, you know, the earlier the perpetrator speaks up before there are those landscape changes, you know, uh, the sooner uh, then that not only could the victim's families be re uh, remains be returned to the families, but also uh, the sooner that person uh, will have done the right thing and then uh, can go to a parole hearing having done the right thing uh, in, in relation to that. Uh, and on the second part of the motion, and I don't want to forget about the child pornography and child identity, we are hearing, any of us who are members of uh, the policing board, here on a constant basis the, about the dark web and how it is being used, not only in relation to sharing uh, information about um, domestic violence, but also about child pornography. And the police are always, unfortunately, a step ahead, although recently they have had uh, some successes alongside uh, their colleagues in the NCA and internationally. But such is the increase in child pornography online in particular, uh, I think it's something like over 60% increase and there are more and more children uh, going on to the uh, register across my own uh, trust area, child protection register in relation to a number uh, of concerns. So I think it is right and proper uh, that we try to get help to those who need it, to those children who are at risk and that the onus is on the offender. Uh, the sooner that people uh, get the message uh, that uh, their 
um, outcomes in relation to their sentencing will depend upon their cooperation with the investigators, the better. And I think that's a message that we need to give out, not only to support those families who are tormented on a day and daily basis, but those I will, yes. This is a very important point. It's not, I think it was Sinead who said it earlier, that it's not only the disclosure, it's the timing of the disclosure oh, yeah. with regards to when they disclose to the families. And that's a very important point that should be taken into consideration too, because the perpetrator might just disclose to get a more lenient sentence in that regard. But the, the member the, has thank an extra minute. Uh, thank you for that intervention. And in fact, that was a point uh, that was made very forcibly by the two families, that they would be very concerned that on the first parole that the perpetrator uh, then gives up the remains. And uh, I think that that should be uh, a graduated um, a consideration by the parole commissioners in relation to any parole hearing. Uh, so I think there has to be a strong message from the chamber here this evening. Thank you. And I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. To lose a loved one to the heinous crime of murder is a huge burden for any family to bear. To not know the location of the remains of your loved one is a pain I find impossible to comprehend. It is a pain that many families have to live with. I have known the Dorian family for many long years. They were a happy family unit living in the seaside village where my family has a retail business. I recall a lovely, well-mannered young child ban her 10p mixes on pocket money day. That pretty little girl was Lisa Dorian. Lisa had her life in front of her. She would go on to have dreams and aspirations and a determination to succeed in life. Fast forward to a dark day in February 2005. 25-year-old Lisa was attending a party in a caravan at a park in Belly Halward. This was the last sighting of Lisa alive. Someone was responsible for her death, and some people were responsible for disappearing her remains. The people who carried this out were people that Lisa may have considered to be her friends. Despite the best endeavors of the PSNI, no one has been charged with her killing, and no information has been forthcoming that would help return Lisa's remains to her family. I know that her family appreciate the sterling efforts and the resources that the PSNI have committed to trying to find Lisa. I watched the devastating effect all this had on her loving family, her mum, her dad, her sisters and the extended family circle. They supported each other and to this day continue to do so. Lisa's mum, Pat, never recovered from the tragic loss of her daughter and died of a broken heart without being able to lay her daughter to rest. Pat was another victim of this crime. I don't believe that the Dorian family care if someone gets 10 years or 20 years in prison, if anyone is ever convicted of this cruel, heartless murder. Their only prayer is that they can finally give Lisa a Christian burial and know that then she can rest in peace. I don't know how anyone involved in this crime can sleep easy in their bed. Maybe they will wake up one morning and do the right thing. Unless they do, the demons of what they did will hunt them to their grave. I only know the Murray family through the media and haven't met them recently in a meeting. They have seen the killer of their loved ones convicted and sentenced, but still crave the return of Charlotte's remains. Charlotte was a twin with her sister Denise. I have twin daughters and I have twin granddaughters. You have to live with twins to even start to appreciate the bond enjoyed by them. And I know that the loss of a sister will be especially and deeply felt by Denise. These families just want one outcome. It is not revenge. It is the return of their loved one's remains. The implementation of Helen's law would offer them hope of such a conclusion. Without this law, their hope will continue to be hollow. Helen's law may not provide what they seek, but it will concentrate the minds of those convicted of a killing where no body is available. I cannot support the amendment from the Alliance Party because I don't believe it will help families like the Murrays and Dorians and others find the, cl the closure that they seek. Mrs. Armstrong uh, raises issues around the motion but there will be 
future opportunities to, find, to fine tune any legislation that eventually comes forward to this House. I find it disappointing today that this House cannot feel able to rally around this motion in unity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I rise to support the amendment. Clearly, the motion has considerable merit, and I commend the proposers for bringing it forward. Uh, it is a very important topic. We cannot fail to be touched by the anguish felt by the families of Lisa Dorian and Charlotte Murray, and we are also filled with admiration for the families' campaigns in theirs and others' memory. No one should be in any doubt that we are all fully in favour of a process which requires cooperation in locating victims' remains to be considered as a fundamental part of parole, and work is ongoing to strengthen that. To be clear, therefore, our amendment is designed to strengthen the motion further by outlining the steps necessary to achieving a legally watertight route to ensuring cooperation in finding remains and identifying victims that forms a statutory part of the parole process, and thus maximising the chance of locating the remains or at least knowing what happened to them. To rob someone of their life and then to rob their loved ones even of the knowledge of their remains is despicable beyond words. That is why we welcome the bill passing through the UK Parliament currently, known as Helen's Law, and the support for it expressed by this chamber today. And we want to see similar steps taken here in Northern Ireland, but we also feel it is essential to outline how these steps will be taken. We recognise also that we must move carefully, but also quickly. We have seen too many other instances of trauma being exasperated by political action in this House, and I think um, Paul Free referred to that earlier. And this must not become another. The amendment is also important because it emphasises that we already have the benefit of seeing the route forward adopted in England so as to ensure it is legally watertight. A lot of work went into Helen's Law, and it does need to be em emphasised that, that what is required is cooperation in locating remains or in identification before release. However, that is not quite what the original motion goes on to say. It does not reflect exactly what Helen's Law delivers. To tr try to do something which is, in effect, what Helen's Law delivers, as implied by the final part of the original motion, would inevitably mean greater complexity and more time taken up. It is in no one's interest, and it is again why the amendment is important, so as to make what we are pursuing legally watertight and deliverable as quickly as possible. We need to be clear that any Charlotte's Law would deliver the same as Helen's Law, namely that, quite correctly, significant weight would be given by the Parole Board to non-disclosure. We do also need to be very aware, given that we do not know when, this similar case, when a similar case might occur, that even a swift legislative intervention to deliver a Charlotte's Law would be unlikely to fit into the legislative programme during the current mandate. This means years could pass with no change. This is not something the Minister, I nor my party colleagues are prepared to wait for. That is again why the amendment is important. We will consider all means of ensuring a pr the Parole Board gives significant weight to non-disclosure so that the family's objectives can be met. And if we can get there by any means in the next few months, rather than the next few years, that is what we will do. Mr Speaker, with that in mind, it is highly unfortunate that the COVID um, situation has impeded uh, a formal meeting between the Justice Minister and the families. I am assured that one will take place urgently, as soon as it is feasible. That will be the best way for the families to outline just how important their campaign is for a sense of truth and justice, and also for the Minister to outline the many steps she has already taken towards achieving this and ensuring that disclosure forms a part not just of the parole, but also of enhancing the prospect of finding out what happened to their loved ones. Having a debate such as this helps the process of de de detailed consideration of the most appropriate and most efficient way towards the interests of families who have suffered such appalling grief and trauma. That is why the motion in itself a useful step as it prioritises the issue and helps clarify many of the issues around it, and why we hope the amendment enhancing the motion will make it legally se secure. In closing, Mr Speaker, to, um, what we want to see is support given to the Minister today so she can move as quickly as possible of, um, on this issue. And we would like um, unanimous support for our amendment. Thank you.
And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this very important issue today. Many members have already spoken about the horrendous pain and anguish suffered by the families of Lisa Dorian, Charlotte Murray and others who have been denied the right and dignity of laying their loved ones' remains to rest. And I would also like to send out my heartfelt thoughts and sympathy to those families today and express support for the continuing campaigns of justice and reform for the law to put specific parole guidance relating to non-disclosure on a statutory footing. Lisa Dorian, has been said, a young woman from Bangor in my constituency, went missing in 2005 and her body has never been recovered. So far the PS and I have arrested 10 people but no one has been charged in relation to her disappearance because her remains have not been recovered and evidence is limited. According to media reports, the police have pursued more than 3,500 lines of inquiry and conducted roughly 400 land, air and sea searches. Throughout all this, her family continue to suffer and bear the burden of severe emotional strain, not knowing what happened to her. On the 15th anniversary of Lisa's, dis Lisa's disappearance, the PSNI stated clearly that they have always believed that a small number of people hold the key to finding out what happened, and I would urge any of them to come forward to the PSNI. Charlotte Murray's family have also suffered terribly since her disappearance in 2012. After a jury convicted the man who murdered her last year, Police drained a local quarry to search for her body, but nothing was found. In his sentencing remarks, Judge Stephen Fowler QC recognised the devastating impact of not being able to lay Charlotte de Rest had on her family. He noted that the non-disclosure of remains has caused and will continue to cause the family considerable pain, distress and hurt. Judge Fowler also stated that he regarded non-disclosure as the most serious aggravating feature of the case. Therefore, this is, there is clear need to reflect this in law, and I would welcome the Minister's comments, not just around the introduction of a bill equivalent to Helen's Law in England and Wales, but also her thoughts on how the sentencing review will address the small number of cases where non-disclosure is an issue. I would like to pay tribute to Charlotte's family for their campaign and introduce legislation equivalent to Helen's Law in Northern Ireland, and I hope that the Minister will be able to bring forward changes that will also reassure and support the family of Lisa Dorian in their continuing battle for justice. The Prisoner's Disclosure of Information about Victims Bill, otherwise known as Helen's Law in England and Wales, places a legal duty on the Parole Board to consider non-disclosure of the location of a victim's body when considering release. And it will also apply to offenders who refuse to reveal the identity of victims where they have been convicted of taking indecent images of children. Parole board guidance states that offenders who withhold information can be denied parole if they are deemed to still pose a risk to the public. But guidance is guidance. Helen's Law makes it a legal requirement for the parole board to consider the withholding of information when making a decision on early release. Human rights legislation protects against indefinite detention and the sentence handed down in a court continues to apply. So the proposed new law in England and Wales strikes a balance between the need to further protect the public while guarding against disrupting the independence of the judiciary. We must, as an assembly, and I'd also put it to my Justice Committee colleagues, why can't we take on this work as Justice Committee? Perhaps the chair of the committee could address this in his remarks, which will be coming later on. But we must, as an assembly, do all we can to improve confidence in the criminal justice system and legislating for this change would provide a more consistent approach for victims and families. So for Lisa, Charlotte, their families, families and many others, this is the very least that we can do. Thank you, and I call Jerry Carl, and the member has about three minutes. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I want to begin by expressing my deepest sympathies with the families uh, who live today without the knowledge uh, of the location of their loved one's body. Um, the families of Lisa Dorian and Catherine Murray as well, um, those who are stripped of the ability to bury their dead and who must face unimaginable anguish that the person who knows that information will not offer it up. This places an impossible block on their ability to come to terms with the untimely passing of their loved ones. And it's right that we acknowledge their reality today, as, as many and most speakers, all speakers have. Um, Mr. Speaker, Helen's law, uh, which today's motion refers to, would legally ensure that parole officers must consider uh, the withholding of a victim's location in mind when they're making a, making a judgment um, about their release. It is backed, obviously, by Marie McCourt, who does not, at this day, know the location of uh, her daughter Helen's body and has lived, lived with that pain for many, many years. Uh, from what I am aware, Mr. Speaker, and like others have mentioned it, uh, parole officers already take this information uh, into account 
Though as the amendment suggests, the Minister will consider legislating for this when stakeholders, stakeholders have been engaged, and, and we will support the amendment uh, as such for those uh, reasons. Um, we, we cannot, Mr Speaker, however, support the motion in its original form. Um, the imposition of a sentence uh, without the option of parole has been questioned in, in multiple courts internationally and has been uh, as being uh, incompatible with human rights. And a blanket ban on parole uh, like this potentially, Mr Speaker, removes uh, any semblance of, in specific cases, uh, of contacts or any attempted rehabilitation. And undoubtedly, there, there are a lot of painful cases in relation to uh, the issues we are talking today. Uh, and we, we have seen many uh, families speaking uh, bravely in the last uh, number of weeks. But to impose a law which denies parole for a subset of, of people, regardless of contacts or extenuating circumstances, I believe is not the appropriate solution. And it's easy to envisage how that kind of law could have, could have undesirable consequences. And Mr Speaker, it's not uh, for us here to determine, uh, I'm certainly not in a position to determine uh, whether or not an, any individual is ready for parole, uh, but it is the job of the Assembly when laying down a law uh, which will be uh, used to determine parole to guarantee that there is room for extenuating circumstances, context uh, um, uh, and the foundation of laws relating to the justice system should be rooted in rehabilitation. Uh, and this motion, Mr. Speaker, uh, if adopted, and um, were the, uh, the Justice Minister to adhere to it, we would run horse and cart through those important uh, principles. Um, and I am concerned, um, uh, generally, Mr. Speaker, when there are debates about crime and, and uh, criminal activity in this House, how uh, there seems to be an approach primarily um, to automatically push for harsher penalties to. Uh, ignore or curtail the benefits and the possibilities of rehabilitation. I just want to say that point uh, uh, generally. So I think my time is up, Mr Speaker, so I'll just leave my, my comments there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I call the Justice Minister Naomi Long, who has 15 minutes to respond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I first of all want to welcome the Assembly's interest in what is a very important issue. Firstly, I want to echo the words of other members in paying tribute to the family of Charlotte Murray for their courage and commitment in pursuing their campaign for change. Charlotte was a loved daughter and sister who was cruelly taken away from her family. Her killer has been convicted, but he has refused to say how she died or where her body is. We all share that pain of Charlotte's family, the pain of not being able to lay her to rest, the pain of not having somewhere to mark her life and her death, the pain of not having um, the opportunity to lay flowers or to feel close to her. And I know that from speaking with them briefly last week, that this adds terribly to their anguish and their suffering. I would also like to pay tribute to the family of Lisa Dorian. For over 15 years, and despite numerous searches, they have suffered the anguish and despair of not knowing what happened to Lisa or where her body is. Bravely, they are supporting Charlotte's family in their campaign. And I would take this opportunity, Mr Speaker, to call again on those who could help to bring an end to their anguish to do so now and without further delay. We must not forget, as we discuss this motion, that these tragic losses are a personal tragedy for them and will affect their lives forever. The bill, which is the subject of the motion and is currently before Parliament, makes changes to prisoner release provisions in England and Wales. It places a statutory obligation on the Parole Board in England and Wales to consider non-disclosure of information on where or how an offender disposed of the victim's remains or about the identity of children in indecent images as part of their assessment as to whether or not such an offender should be released on licence. These release provisions will apply to those who have been convicted of murder or manslaughter, those serving a life sentence or an extended determinate sentence, and where the Board believes a prisoner seeking parole has information about those matters. The Board must also take into account what, in its view, are the reasons for the non-disclosure. For example, it must weigh up whether, due to the passage of years or illness during their time in prison, the prisoner is uncertain of the details or where they are making a deliberate decision not to disclose that information. It is then for the Parole Board to decide what bearing this has on the risk that the prisoner poses and whether that risk can be managed in the community. It does not and is not no disclosure, no parole, which members have repeatedly suggested throughout this debate. 
Under parole board guidance, these are matters which are already taken into account as part of the board's risk assessment of a prisoner's suitability for release. <coughs> The main effect of the Bill, therefore, is to place existing parole board guidance on a statutory footing. It does not place any obligation on the board to withhold release where the prisoner withholds information. The assessment of future risk is the determining factor in release decisions for the parole board, as it is for the parole commissioners in Northern Ireland. Article 46 in Schedule 2 of the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008 set out the powers of the parole commissioners. This legislation confirms that the parole commissioners must be satisfied that, there is no longer, that it is no longer necessary for the protection of the public from serious harm to detain an individual in prison to reach such a decision that a prisoner should be released on licence. <coughs> I should clarify here that the parole commissioners are involved in release decisions where an offender has been sentenced to a life sentence or an indeterminate or extended custodial sentence. These public protection sentences were introduced in the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008. It is important to note that offenders convicted for taking or making indecent photographs of children under the protection of Children Northern Ireland Order 1978 will only have parole commissioner involvement in their release decisions where they have been assessed as dangerous and have been sentenced to one of those public protection sentences. These sentences were also introduced <clears throat> in the 2008 order to replace the earlier arrangements where prisoners were released on remission at the halfway point of their sentence with no ongoing responsibilities for supervision. The parole commissioners have no role in the release of prisoners serving normal determinate sentences, which consist of a custodial period and a period spent on licence. The length of both periods is set by the court at the time of sentencing. For these sentences, the commissioners only become involved in the re-release of offenders who have been recalled to custody for the breach of licence conditions. Before making a release decision, the commissioners assess all information relating to the offence for which the prisoner was sentenced and all information rela relating to the offender during his or her time in prison, including any progress towards rehabilitation and their acceptance of guilt. I understand that there have been no cases as yet where the parole commissioners have had to consider the non-disclosure of victims' remains or the identity of children in indecent photographs as part of the parole process. But if such a case arose, it would be an important factor in consideration of release. It would be for the parole panel to decide what barring non-disclosure and the reasons for it had on the risk that the prisoner poses and whether that risk can be safely managed in the community. A lack of acceptance of guilt non-disclosure of the location of remains or non-disclosure of the identity of children in indecent photographs could be considered as an indication that the prisoner has not addressed their offending behaviour, that it shows lack of insight, remorse or empathy, and that it could lead to a conclusion that the prisoner still poses too high a level of risk to be released. The Parole Commissioner Rules 2009 underpinned the parole review process. These provide significant discretion to the commissioners to direct information from any party to inform the parole review and consider applications from any person to be a witness in the parole review process. The commissioners are not constrained in what they can consider in their assessment of risk, including the views of victims and their families. Currently, victims who register <coughs> with any of the three victim information schemes the Prisoner Release Information uh, Victim Information Scheme, the Mentally Disordered Offenders Victim Information Scheme and the Probation Board for Northern Ireland Victim Inter Information Scheme are notified of parole reviews and can apply through my department to the Commissioners to be considered as an interested party to those proceedings. Where this is approved and agreed, victims and their families may provide written or oral statements on the impact of the offence and, if applicable, provide views on the potential release and licence conditions of the offender. As you will be aware, Mr Speaker, it is my intention um, to look in the autumn at the potential of a Victims of Crime Commissioner, which I would be minded to introduce. I see one of those roles is to increase the uptake of those existing rights, because currently there is very low engagement with families um, beyond the point of sentencing that needs to be looked at carefully as to why that is the case. 
Victims registered with the schemes are also notified about parole review decisions, but currently this is limited solely to whether the decision is to release the prisoner on licence or for them to remain in custody. I think we can do more in recognition of the importance to victims and their families of the parole process and its outcome. Where offenders are released, I appreciate that victims and their families can feel powerless and frustrated when they do not know the factors underpinning such a release decision. This autumn, I will be tabling an amendment to the Parole Commissioner's rules to provide that registered victims, instead of receiving notification solely of the outcome, will be notified of the factors that have been relied upon to inform the Parole Commissioner's decisions. This will be an automatic right for registered victims, regardless of whether or not they have submitted a statement to the Parole Review. It will also provide a platform for legal challenge if victims or their families consider the decision was unreasonable, unfair or unlawful. This is an important change that will, if accepted by the Assembly, significantly enhance the transparency of the parole review process. However, and most importantly in my mind, I hope that it will help victims and their families feel that their role in that process is fully recognised and acknowledged. I will appreciate that the pain and anguish they feel does not end when an offender is sentenced. Those offences have changed their lives irrevocably and have changed their future. What must it be like to have a dearly loved member of your family murdered but never know how they died or where their body is? To wonder but never know whether your child had been abused? Those thoughts haunt victims and families daily. I realise that to be told the offender will be released into the community must be distressing for victims of all serious offences involving life sentences or public protection sentences. The least victims deserve is to be told the rationale for those decisions. I believe that this will be a positive step which will help victims have confidence in the parole process and the decisions of the commissioners, who I know are very aware of the weight of their responsibilities. However, I appreciate that such a change does not address the specific concerns of the families of Charlotte Murray or Lisa Dorian or members who have spoken so passionately on this matter in the Chamber today. I appreciate having listened very carefully to all of the contributions today that some members believe that a refusal to disclose information should mean that parole is automatically denied, or that Helen's Law indeed will make this the case in England and Wales. That is incorrect. While I can understand such views, I think it is important that the discretion of the independent parole commissioners is maintained. They already have the onerous task when considering such cases of weighing the account to be taken of non-disclosure and any reasons for it in consideration of release. I will. Thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. Just in relation to Helen's Law and, and Mr Beattie's suggestion that there could be an LCM, I think we discussed here in the Chamber this morning that we are much better to make our own legislation, and that's not to take away from the work that has been done. And in relation to the Domestic Abuse Bill, we have looked at Scotland, we've looked at the Westminster Bill. We do consider them, but I think it is important that we make our own legislation here in this Assembly. I thank the Member for her intervention, and I'm actually going to come on to that specific point. It isn't an easy task, and I'm very conscious that release, um, that should release be conditional on disclosure. It is possible that with the passage of time, such disclosure may be highly fallible and inconclusive. It could also potentially have the unintended consequence of encouraging disclosure of inaccurate information in order to become eligible for consideration. And it should be remembered that some offenders may be particularly manipulative and wish to inflict more pain on the families, and that should not be forgotten. Incorrect information would be particularly harmful in the case of the identity of victims in the case of indecent images of children. Um, in the case such as that of Vanessa George, to which me another member referred, it is also possible the prisoner either may not have or be sure of the identities of the children and could incorrectly name individuals who are not those children who were in the images. And that could cause additional anguish to parents and children alike. Punishment is one of the purposes of sentencing, and it is for the independent judiciary to determine the appropriate sentence. The parole process, however, is not designed to be punitive, but is about managing risk. The issue of non-disclosure is already considered by the judge in determining the appropriate tariff or sentence. For example, in Charlotte's case, this was considered to be the most serious aggravating factor when the, center was, when the sentence was determined, as members have reflected. That is directly accounted for in the calculation of sentence or in the case of life or indeterminate sentences in calculation of the tariff. 
Where a sentence is imposed that requires release decisions to be made by the parole commissioners, that forms part of the sentence. This aspect is made clear to the offender at the time of sentencing. It is a point of sentence that punishment is applied, Mr Speaker. We have a long legal tradition that the latter parole stage is focused on assessing the risk to the public in any release, and it would be a significant departure from this to use non-disclosure for punitive reasons. As I have said, the legislative test for the parole commissioners is that it is no longer necessary to protect the public from serious harm for the prisoner to remain in custody. The parole commissioner's role is to implement the release provisions of the sentence and decide release on the basis of risk. To do otherwise would be a fundamental change to the basis on which release decisions are made and could have unintended consequences. The motion calls for introduction of legislation similar to the bill in, in England and Wales. As I've already highlighted, the bill does not, as some seem to think, equal no disclosure, no release. It simply puts current parole review process, processes on a statutory footing. So it will be considered, but it is not determinative. It's also important to note that what is legislated for in England and Wales is not necessarily appropriate for Northern Ireland. Before considering any change along such lines in Northern Ireland, I want to give very careful consideration to the need for change, if change is appropriate, and how that can be best tailored to ensure that it is right for Northern Ireland. Our sentencing structures, the structure of our parole commission, are all quite distinct and different to those in England and Wales, and an LCM would not be appropriate in this case. I would caution members today of all days to be wary of the allure of speedy changes to the law. The potential for unintended consequences, as well as intended ones, are significant and far-reaching. It is right that we consider very carefully any proposed change in the law before embarking on that process. That is why I have already asked officials to initiate a focused engagement with relevant key stakeholders including, but not limited to, members of Charlotte and Lisa's families, with whom I will also have a further meeting soon, the parole commissioners, the probation board and prison service. I also want to give careful consideration to the points raised by members of this assembly today and review the debates in England and Wales on Helen's Law. This will enable me to determine how we address families and members' concerns in the most effective and most appropriate way possible in Northern Ireland. I intend this exercise to be completed in as short as possible a period of time, and I'm glad to say that work has already begun. The work is being carried out alongside the work currently being undertaken to complete the sentencing review, recognising, of course, that the role of the parole commissioner sits apart from the sentencing process. I will advise and members and Charlotte and Lisa's families of my conclusions on a way forward later this year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. And I now call John Blair to wind on the amend, and the member has five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, winding on the uh, amendment, I firstly want to echo the sentiments of other members in applauding the family of Charlotte Burry for their courage and commitment in pursuing their campaign and to see change. Charlotte was a loved daughter and sister who was callously taken from her family, uh, a family who have endured unimaginable suffering, the pain of not being able to lay their sister to rest, the pain of not having a place to mark a daughter's life and death, pain for, for most of us, which would of course be inconceivable. I would also like to pay tribute to the family of Lisa Dorian, who through their own grief have bravely supported Charlotte's family in their campaign. For over 15 years, Lisa's family have suffered anguish and despair of not knowing what happened to Lisa and have never been able to lay her to rest. As we move to vote on the proposed motion and the amendment, we consider that these malicious acts are a personal tragedy for the families and the friends of Charlotte and Lisa, and these tragic losses will, of course, affect their lives forever. As I wind up the debate, I want to re-emphasise the comments of my colleagues earlier, Kelly Armstrong and Paula Bradshaw. They reflect that there is not sufficient recognition of the importance to victims and their families of their parole process and its outcomes. And in situations where offenders are released, victims and their families can understandably feel powerless and frustrated when they do not know the factors underpinning a, a decision. But I appreciate having listened very carefully to all of the contributions today, Mr Speaker, that some members believe that a refusal to disclose information should mean that parole is automatically denied. While I can understand such views, I think it's important that the discretion of the independent parole commissioners is maintained. They have the onerous task when considering such cases of weighing the account to be taken of non-disclosure and any reasons for this in consideration. 
for release. Mr Speaker, this is not an easy task and I am conscious that should disclosure be conditional on release, it is possible that with the passage of time such disclosure might be highly fallible and inconclusive. Time, however, does pass and there might be uncertainty about identities and locations. These are practical and legislative challenges and they are real. They are matters that can be addressed in the sentence review process initiated by the Minister uh, and currently underway. I now want to, Mr Speaker, time permitting, reflect as best I can on the contributions of members. I will not, I don't think, have time to do that individually, but I will try to uh, reflect on contributions in a cross-party way. Uh, Alex Easton, opening on the motion, uh, stressed the non-political background of the motion, uh, the background of Helen's Law. He also spoke eloquently of the grief and trauma for families. Kelly Armstrong, proposing the amendment, uh, pointed out that she believed the motion went beyond Westminster legislation and cautioned on potential disparity between the sentence handed down and that served. Linda Dillon spoke in support of the amendment. She, she uh, said it could be a beginning of a process to deal properly with these crimes. Sinead Bradley for the SDLP spoke in support of the motion and spoke of unimaginable pain for families um, and then turned to whether or not disclosure is deliberate. Doug Beattie uh, spoke then of the existing role of the parole board, uncertainty of a family not knowing when a killer will get parole. Rachel Woods uh, spoke uh, in the detail of the sentence and review and that she would like to see some information on that and also referred to hope for change. Jerry Carroll referred uh, to quite some extent to the current parole process. We've since heard from the Minister, who spoke of the bills in question, detail of current processes and, of course, the time frames involved in those as well. Uh, I would, uh, Mr Speaker, before I close, want again to express my sympathy to the families of Charlotte and Lisa uh, for the pain and anguish they have suffered. I would urge that we follow processes already in place to achieve a good outcome, and I would encourage members to support the amendment. And I call Paul Given to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. And uh, the member has ten minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and can I thank all members for taking part uh, in this uh, debate this afternoon? I think, given the breadth of contributions that we've heard from around the House and all of the different parties that have taken part is a demonstration of uh, how this issue does touch upon all of our constituents and is an issue that we all care passionately about. And I don't for one moment uh, call into question the sincerity of anybody's motives uh, in terms of what they have said, and, and nor should anybody call into our motives. And Some members did talk about politicking, and uh, I, I don't think that that's appropriate. Uh, and I wouldn't say that about those that have tabled the amendment, even though I disagree uh, with the contents uh, of the amendment. I want to pay tribute uh, to my colleague Alex Easton for bringing forward this motion. This is something that he has spoken to me extensively about. He has pursued for a long period of time and has engaged with the First Minister, uh, who supports the, these endeavours uh, and has uh, engaged with the families. And I want to pay tribute to Alex uh, for the work that he has done in respect of this. I want to thank uh, the uh, Dorian and the Murray families for the way in which they have given voice uh, to this issue. We can often debate uh, legalistic points, uh, but whenever families speak, they speak uh, powerfully, and, and that often resonates with the public in a way that often politicians are, are unable to do. So I want to, to pay tribute to them. I thought Alan Chambers brought that personal connection to members very well when he spoke about Lisa coming in as a little child and buying the, the 10p mix-up from the shop. And that, I think, hit home to members about the, the real personal aspect of what it is that we're talking about and the absolute tragedy uh, for that family who still haven't uh, been able to, to get justice in any shape or form. And I would call, again join with members uh, that have called for that information to come forward uh, so that the families can get uh, some justice in respect uh, of that issue. Whenever members uh, spoke about this, they spoke about uh, the coercive nature of the perpetrators, the, the continued desire to inflict further pain upon the families. Uh, Dolores Kelly, Sinead Bradley, Paul Frew uh, uh, mentioned the, these different aspects, as did, did other members. And how true that is, and how appalling it is, that uh, not just enough to carry out the murder 
um, or uh, to engage in the sexual abuse of children that paedophiles engage in, but to then withhold information that could lead to the identification of the remains or to those victims uh, speaks to the kind of evil that exists uh, for the people that carry that out. And that's why we need to have a system in place that can address that and undermine the kind of power that those perpetrators uh, seek to inflict. And so I'm concerned whenever I heard members speak about the rights of the perpetrator in that context uh, and that human rights compliance when it would come to what we are seeking to do. I think that does a disservice to those that believe in true human rights uh, whenever it's used in that way. Uh, and uh, I, I do disagree with the arguments that were being put forward in respect of those concerns that, that members articulated. Kelly Armstrong made reference to not being human rights compliant, uh, outlined reasons why we shouldn't be supporting the motion, uh, spoke of concerns about accidental indefinite uh, uh, detention, which of course she had Bradley addressed when she spoke about the deliberate withholding of this information uh, and the safeguards that uh, it would be there uh, to address those things. And, and Kelly Armstrong went on to, to say that politicians should not be able to interfere in sentencing. My, my. Politicians shouldn't be allowed to interfere in sentencing. The judiciary set the sentence based upon a sentencing framework that politicians set. I don't believe for one minute we should be involved in saying X deserves this sentence, but we set the framework that the judiciary operate in. And so it's important that uh, politicians do engage in this issue and don't dispel their responsibility uh, to, to others. Uh, and um, she made reference to the minister's consultation. That's good. Uh, she made reference to the uh, review around sentencing uh, framework. Again, that's good. We would like to see it commissioned back in 2016. Uh, we still haven't seen uh, progress in respect of that coming forward. Uh, and so this motion, I think, sends out that very clear message and signal that we want to have action. We want to see the Minister for Justice lead on that. That, that will not absolve the Justice Committee of stepping up in the absence of the Justice Minister stepping up. Um, we will have a miscellaneous provisions bill, uh, hopefully come in due course, and that will give opportunity for not just this issue, but other issues members have uh, raised in this House uh, to be taken forward through that bill. But it shouldn't be for backbenchers at a committee uh, to lead on this. The Justice Minister needs to lead on this, and that's why this motion calls upon the Justice Minister to lead on it. And so I was concerned when Kelly Armstrong again made reference to this will just be a non-binding motion if it's passed. Members shouldn't lightly dismiss a motion passed by this Assembly because it mandates and calls upon action uh, by those that are named in it. And this motion uh, calls the Minister to take action. And I, I'm confident that the Alliance Amendment isn't going to be successful. And therefore, I hope that the attitude that was displayed by uh, Ms Armstrong is not one that is taken into account by this Minister and that we're going to see actions brought forward. The Minister mentioned in, uh, in response that the sentence takes into account this as an aggravating factor. Just to remind members, the, the, the murderer um, of, of Charlotte Murray got 16 years. That's all. 16 years. Sentence and a tariff of 16 years. There is a distinct difference. The tariff is the first point, a point in the sentence where a person can apply for parole. The sentence is life, and it is life because even when he is released, he will continue to be a life sentence prisoner. He got 16 years to serve in prison. So we minimum, ma, ma, minimum. but ma, this is the point that we're making: 16 years to serve in, in prison, and then the conditions for release. We're talking about those conditions for release that. He shouldn't be released if there is not disclosure. And, and so the Minister's response to this gives me even further concern that she's not listening to what members are saying. So uh, this is why the motion needs to be passed. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I is, is it a point well, of order? Or? Member, it is a point of order. A, sorry, let, let's both, sorry, take a seat. Are you making a point of order? Point of order. Mr. Speaker. Point of order. 
I am listening carefully to what members say, and I do not appreciate my position being misrepresented by others in the chamber. It is unhelpful to do so. But what I am doing is conveying accurately how sentencing works, and that is my duty as the Minister of Justice. So yeah, well, I think all those I, that has to be clarified for the record, Mr. Speaker. I thank you for putting on the record, but that has been made in your own remarks earlier. So continue, Mr. Gibbon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would just say to the Minister not to be so defensive when members raise issues. We're doing it in a spirit of wanting to see progress being made, and the Minister doesn't always need to be so defensive when it comes to members raising these points. So, in, in seeking to, to wind on this, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I do believe that we need to send out a very clear message. I'm on the side of the victims. I believe everyone in this uh, House is on that side of the victims. I believe we need a very clear process to get them the kind of justice that they need. And I believe we need to send a very clear message to murderers and to paedophiles in this society that if you don't disclose information, you shouldn't be released. And so I am wanting to go further than Helen's Law. I, the, the motion makes that clear. It says it uh, for members to see that uh, we want to see, uh, just to get the, the precise wording of it, um, to ensure that prisoners convicted of murder and child sex offences are not eligible for release until they disclose the location of their victim's remains or identity. That's what I want. Uh, and so be in no doubt what it is that uh, this motion is, is speaking to. And I would just say on the amendment um, that the, the Alliance Party have put forward, the families can say this better than I can, and maybe the Alliance Party will reflect on it. And I would appeal to them to listen to the families and not to move their amendment and try and come with where the majority of people are. But they, they said in respect um, of this amendment um, that we received through correspondence that the Alliance Amendment has caused considerable upset for both families. We would strongly urge you to reject this proposed amendment as the content weakens the original motion and diminishes the level of justice that we seek. So I would appeal to members to reject the amendment and to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you. And the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Kelly Armstrong and Paula Bradshaw be made. All those in favour say aye. The country no. I think the ayes have it, but while we have social distancing in operation. Sorry, the noes. Sorry, the noes, and therefore then the amendment would fall. But given the issue around social distancing, I just want to remind members it's not always entirely simple to. You know, declare a vote passed or, or, or failed. So I'm going to ask it again, and if there are any dissensions, I will divide the House. So uh, all those in favour of the amendment say aye. Country no. No. I think the, ayes, the noes have it. The noes have it. Okay, on uh, that basis, then the question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour. Sorry. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. Moving on. The item five on the order paper, the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do 